Well, hello and welcome to the good old days of radio show. I'm talking slower. I'm talking a little more creepy than usual. And I'm doing that on purpose because we are starting a new series of 10 more great horror shows. The ability of the creators, the writers, the producers, and the stars of radio to do horror slash supernatural type programs was just phenomenal. Radio has always been called the theater of the mind, the most imaginative media ever created, because you are not shown the monster, or you're not shown the ghost, or you're not shown whatever it is that's uh, evil and creeping towards you. It's all done with words and sound effects, and you create those pictures in your mind. Television and film will show you, show you all those things. With radio, you get to create it yourself, and everybody creates it slightly different. There are no two monsters created equally, as they say. So, what I recommend for these, and we're going to have 10 of them starting this week uh, with the first one, is that you really get yourself secluded somewhere, turn off your screen on your phone, turn off any distracting noises, turn out your lights, and sit alone or next to someone you love, but preferably alone, in the dark, and just listen to these and immerse yourself in the writing, the sound effects, the production, and I think you'll find that these radio plays from 60, 70 years ago hold up really, really well and will really give you a little jolt and thrill as you listen to them. Um, the first one is called The Night Has a Thousand Eyes, starring Edward G. Robinson. It's from the Screen Director's Playhouse of February 27, 1949. Um, it was a film as well, so if you like this radio show, you can watch the film version, but Again, I think the radio version will be superior because you're going to create everything in your mind. In the film version, they're going to kind of show it to you, as I recall, because I did see the film. Um, but anyway, we'll start with that. And then from there, we're going to move in the next few weeks through uh, the great radio series Lights Out. Um, also, some episodes of Quiet, Please, and Escape, uh, and some more Lights Out. And these will be selected uh, by us here at the Good Old Days of Radio Show as great examples of radio horror. So, um, by yourself, in a room, with the lights out, please, here is The Night Has a Thousand Eyes. From Hollywood, the NBC Theater presents... <laughs> Theater presents the Screen Directors Guild production of A Chronicle of Fear. Paramount's Night Has a Thousand Eyes, with its original team of screen director John Farrell, screen star Edward G. Robinson, and William Demers. Although technical and artistic skills are the everyday instruments of the motion picture director, the very heart of his craft is fashioned from another sort of knowledge, the knowledge of the world in which he lives. And that can be gained only by living a life rich in experience. Such is the background of tonight's guest on the NBC Theater. A native Australian, he has been a seaman, soldier of fortune, adventurer at large, and has made an enduring mark as a scholarly writer of fiction and nonfiction. Here, then, is the director of many famous Paramount films, such as Wake Island, Two Years Before the Mast, The Big Clock, the soon-to-be-released alias Nick Beale, and tonight's story, Night Has a Thousand Eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Farrell. Night Has a Thousand Eyes is a story of the supernatural, 
but it is not a flight of fancy. Counterparts of the strange phenomena in tonight's story have been the subject of recent scientific study by some of our universities. Thus, through the medium of film, and now through the radio, we attempt to reveal a bizarre and a rather terrifying aspect of the strange, strange world in which we live. Now for the first time on the air, here is Night Has a Thousand Eyes, starring Edward G. Robinson as John Triton, with William Demarest as Lieutenant Sean. <laughs> In the drawing room of the fine suburban home, a young man named Carson reads a strange manuscript while the company listens gravely and silently. My dear Carson, as you read this manuscript, I will be dead. No one is to blame. My death was as certain as all the other strange events I foresaw. Some of you who have seen me die will we'll doubt this story. And, and this dismissed it as a series of contrived events and coincidences. But you, but you, Carson, and some of the others will know that there are things on Earth still hidden from us, still secret and unfathomable. I suppose most men can look back and see the exact point where destiny touched them. My destiny came upon me on the night of August 3rd, 1929. I was billed as Triton, the mental wizard, like most mind-reading acts, it was a phony, but a first-class phony. Jenny, my lovely fiancé, had collected all the questions from the audience, and my good friend Whitney Cortland was ready for his part at the piano. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from where I stand, I shall endeavor to read the questions which you have written and which are now unopened, mind you, in that glass bowl. Now, if I may have a little quiet music, Mr. Cortland. Let me see... I sense a name, a lady's name, Brian, no, By Byer, that's it, Byers, uh, Clara Byers. Miss Byers asks a question. She wishes to know, she, uh, she, something's wrong. There are disruptive impulses coming from the audience. A woman in a white dress, a little boy, a, a madam, uh, you there in the third row. Your little boy's in great danger. You must go home at once. At once! Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue where we left off. If I may have some quiet music, Mr. Cortland. The incident disturbed me. But then I forgot about it entirely until late that night when the telephone rang in my room. It was the woman calling to tell me that she had come home to find the boy's room in flames. She had arrived just in time to save the child's life. And I was worried, deeply worried, although not yet frightened. There were other incidents, one of them brought on by Courtney's usual concern about our economic situation. Well, kids, it's the same old story. Broke again. We could stand a little ready cash. Matter of fact, I'm going to put our last ten spot on ready cash in the fifth at Green Meadows. Ready cash? No, no, uh, not ready cash. He'll fall and have to be destroyed. Bear Gint. Bear Gint by two lengths. Ready cash fell and had to be destroyed. Bear Gint won by two lengths. It occurred to me that we might make fortunes this way. I didn't want to. It scared me. I began having a crazy feeling that by telling them, I was making the things come true. I began to wonder, would anything have happened if I'd kept quiet? And then one dismal rainy day, I had my chance to find out. I was coming out of the theater. A little boy recognized me and asked me for an autograph. And then he turned to skip away. Wait, son! I'd, I'd had a vision of a car skidding on the slick pavement. A wild cry. And then I thought, no, perhaps if I keep it to myself, it won't happen. Uh-uh, not, nothing, son. <laughs> Just run along now, run along. He went. A moment later... It was no use. After the boy's 
death, I knew I could foresee these events, but I was powerless to prevent their coming true. Look, Johnny, I just met a big oil man down in the lobby who wants us to come in on this, uh, this Comanche Hills oil field. Well, so what? Well, do you suppose you could get a hunch on a sporting proposition like that? Might make us a lot of money. No, 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 it's no good, Court. We're washed up on hunches. Why, Johnny? Well, because I'm scared, Jenny, plain scared. I haven't had a very good feeling about it myself, Johnny. Well, all right. We'd better get down to the theater then and earn it the hard way. Curtain in 20 minutes. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you will all please concentrate on the sealed questions you have addressed to me, please. Uh, a little quiet music, Mr. Cortland. I'm concentrating on a particular envelope. A uh, young lady's handwriting. She, the young lady. The lady, uh... I looked at Jenny. Stared at Jenny, so beautiful, so... So fragile and desirable and so much to me. I saw her and something else. Johnny. Bring down the curtain. Johnny, what's the matter? Bring down the curtain, I tell you. Bring down the curtain! <laughs> Are you sure you feel better now, Johnny? Oh, sure, Jenny. <laughs> I, I, I just felt a little dizzy out there. <laughs> you sure had us worried there for a while. Hmm. Oh, Court. Yeah? Had a sort of a minor hunch about that uh, Comanche Hills oil proposition. Be one of the richest oil pools in the country. Make us all rich. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, now let's go out and eat. No, uh, you and Jenny go ahead. I'll join you later. Maybe it was the wrong decision, but I went away. What I'd seen that night on the stage had been Jenny's death. If I stayed, we'd be married and there'd be a child. The child would live, but Jenny wouldn't. I had to go away to save Jenny's life and save my own sanity. I knew Cortland would take care of Jenny and Comanche Hills Oil would take care of both of them. Yes, but I knew I had to get away from people, especially the people I loved. I went away. It didn't work. A year later, I heard that Jenny had married Cortland. She died when her daughter Jean was born. I read about it in Variety. For 20 years... I lived almost a hermit's life and had no more visions. This gift or the curse seemed to wither it from this use. And then after 20 years, on the night of Jean's debut, I stood outside in the crowd and I watched her go inside the fine hotel, holding tight to Court's arm. Jenny's daughter was lovely, and I was proud. I watched them disappear inside and... And after 20 years of peace, it happened. For a moment, I saw the image of wreckage. The smoking wreckage of an airplane. And then it was gone. What did it mean this time? But nothing happened. And I forgot about it completely for three months and... But one day in my shop, I turned on a small radio I just repaired. And now the 1155 news brought by your Comanche oil reporter. New York, flying his converted army bomber, Whitney Cortland, multimillionaire president of Comanche oil, took off from LaGuardia Airport early today in an attempt to smash the east-west transcontinental record. He and his pilot, former army flyer Richard Sam... No! It was Warren Jean. <laughs> Cortland, I'm, 
I, I'm sorry to force my way in here, but I have an extremely important message for your father. I'm sorry, but my father isn't here now. Uh, see here, old man, I'm Miss Cortland's fiance. Miss Cortland... Well, you've got to reach your father when he lands in Wichita to refuel. But why? You must halt the flight. Halt the flight? That's absurd. Why should father give up his flight? But if flight? he doesn't, this plane will crash. How do you know that? Oh, Miss Cortland, please, you're, you're wasting priceless time. All right, I'll call. But I'll ask you a lot of questions afterwards. I want to talk to Wichita, Kansas Airport. I haven't the number. You make a practice of predicting plane crashes? Oh, no. I'll wait, thank you. Maybe just the planes of very rich oh, men. Please. Huh? Perhaps you're betting that he doesn't beat the record. Hello. Hello, this is Whitney Cortland's daughter. When my father lands, have him call me immediately, will you? Oh, no. Oh, no! <laughs> the radio had it a few minutes later. In an hour, the extras were on the street. The Comanche Angel had crashed in Kansas. Both men were dead. You've been very kind helping me over these past few days, Mr. Triton. I'm so grateful. Well, your father was my best friend. But if you'd only warned us sooner, if, if you'd only known sooner... I don't think it would have made any difference. Mr. Triton, what's wrong? You have a new maid. Well, yes, why? You have a Nemerald bracelet. Yes. Get rid of the maid before the bracelet. Before... What? Please, uh, uh, tell me. Jean, it doesn't matter now. Why doesn't it matter? You mean, not to me? You mean, I won't need the bracelet? You... You mean, I, I'm going to die too? Tell me! Yes. When? Soon? When? Before the end of the week. At night. Under the stars. Oh. Gee. <laughs> NBC Theater is presenting the Screen Directors Guild production of Night Has a Thousand Eyes, starring Edward G. Robinson with William Demarest and introducing the director of the film, John Farrow. remember, Carson, you went to the police. They told you, yes, there had been a John Triton mental wizard who pretended to be able to predict things back in the 20s. They sent a certain Detective Lieutenant Sean to investigate me where I was staying in Jean's house. My first interview with Sean in my little room under the eaves, far from reassure the good lieutenant, for even as I answered his bitter questions, the veil lifted again. And I saw. I saw. Hey, Triton. Come out of it. Hey. I... I see a flower. Ah, drop it, Triton. Cut. A flower. Crushed and broken. I hear a sudden wind shaking the windows. I hear a voice saying, there's no danger now. And I see her. Who? Jean. Lying under the stars. And, and beside her, the paws and talons of a... of a lion. A lion under the stars. Did you find out what time this happens to, uh, to Miss Cortland? Tonight, as the clock strikes 11. <laughs> Lieutenant.
Lieutenant Sean was all for arresting me at once. The rest of you were tolerantly skeptical, which saved me for a while. Downstairs with Jean and you, Carson, were two gentlemen, a Mr. Gilman. Mr. Gilman, president of Mid-Tide Oil. Good evening, Mr. Triton. And a Mr. Myers, attorney for Cortland's estate. How do you do, Mr. Triton? Together, we sat down for the next two hours. Our lives were geared to the relentless machinery of the grandfather's clock that ticked away near the curtained archway. Frankly, I think this is ridiculous. Sitting around like this when we should be looking for a packet of missing options? I'm sure I'll find them, Mr. Myers. They'll be worth us in 36 hours. Gina, are you sure you can't remember where your father put those options? Please, Mr. Gilman, I'm much too upset. Well, the mid-tide merger can't go through without them. I suggest Jean be permitted to forget about big business while we all concentrate on... on... the clock, Mr. Carson. Shut up, Brighton. Four. Five. Seven, eight, nine, ten. One down. And one more hour to go. And so far, nothing has materialized in your weird chain of events. A crushed flower, indeed. A lion, a sudden wind. Anyone interested in the 10 o'clock news? Here. Personally, I'm interested in the 11 o'clock news. Which was upset in a collision tonight at Wilshire and Sepulveda. The lion escaped when a trailer... Lion. Crashed around the Turn that off. Van. Lion. Lock the doors. Lock the windows. Put out some light. I'll lock up and go through the whole house. Thanks, Gilman. Well, there's the lion. We haven't heard a wind or seen a crushed flower or heard anyone say... Don't say no... it. Sorry. Hey, those carnations in that vase. Get them out. Carnations? Get them out. I don't believe any of this, but I'm taking no chance. I'll get them, Lieutenant. Care. Careful now. <laughs> Stand back. Don't anybody move. Ah. <sighs> Not a one crushed. <sighs> that was a close one. Mr. Myers, huh? there's something sticking out under your foot. Something, huh? Lord. A carnation. Crushed and broken. That does it, Triton. No, not quite. Nothing final can happen until 11 o'clock. And it ain't going to happen because you're around. I'm taking you downtown until after 11. All right, Lieutenant, but it won't do any good. I'll be back at 11. Stand still, Triton. Relax. Yes, but I tell you, Sean, if you let me return to Jean's house, there's a chance I can use this power of mine to save her. You put on a good show, Triton. Only I ain't buying. Now, listen... You have a man in the cell here. His name is Amos Block. I see him in the cell now, a suicide. You don't say. Well, there's one I can check on. Hello. Quinn? Sean. How's Block doing? Uh-huh. Thanks. In his cell, playing solitaire. Well, nevertheless, I see him in his... Now I'm going to leave you with the boys here and go back to Miss Cortland's. Be good, huh? Fifteen minutes, too, Jean. Yes. Yeah, everything is under control. It's uh, very copacetic. Ah! Oh, dear. Close that French window. Close it. I'll close it, Lieutenant. I thought Gilman took care of that. Where is Gilman, by the way? There. That does it all right. Sudden wind. Yeah. Ah! I'll get it. Yeah? Oh, yeah, Quinn? No. Amos Blanc hung himself in his cell, but he can't do that. That's suicide. Hey, look, I want Triton here before it strikes 11. I don't care how, but get him here. What time is it? Uh, 10.47. Oh, Lord, you made the night too long. Just one more minute to go, darling. Forty-five seconds. Oh, oh, Mr. Myers. Well, folks, you can forget the lion. 
They just killed it over at Destrin Hospital. Oh, thank goodness. This is it, 11 o'clock. Elliot. Yeah? Back to back with me. Miss Cortland, get between us. Don't anybody move. I'll shoot the man who does. That's it, folks. It's all over. Nothing's happened. Oh, Elliot. Elliot, darling. It's all history now, dear. Forget it. Elliot. Hmm? I'm, I'm going outside. I'll go with you. No. I want to get used to standing out under the stars again. Alone. And not being afraid. Thank you, dear. Thank you so much, all of you. I'll say this for Triton. He sure called his shots except that voice saying, there's no danger now. You just said it. Yeah, but it's too late now to mean anything. Ain't it? Sean. Come in, Professor, come in. Where is she? Where's Miss Cortland? Outside. You let her go outside? It's after 11. No, it's not. Look at the clock. That clock is wrong. It was right. Well, then it's been tampered with. I've got to go to her. Stop, Triton. Haul her out, shoot. It's too late for that after him. You mustn't get near Jean. Your troubles are over now. There's no danger now. Eleven o'clock. And the voice saying, there's no danger. <gasps> he must have met you. No, oh, you don't. No, please. Yeah. Gilman. Gilman. Let go of her. Let go of her, you fool. Hey, Sean. Right. Get him. Plugged him. But good. Gene, Gene, are you all right? Oh, Elliot. It's all right, Gene. You're safe now. Triton's dead. Triton? Dead? But it was Gilman who tried to kill me. Gilman, he didn't want those options found. But I didn't think he'd resort to murder. Oh, poor Mr. Gilman. He died to save me. But are you all right? My throat hurts. Elliot, hmm? look. Mr. Triton. He, he's resting against the foot of that... that marble lion. Marble lion. Of course. And that, Carson, ends this dark diary. I foresaw everything, even my own death. And tonight at headquarters, I, I finished this diary. I left it in my pocket for you to find. Only time and the expanding wisdom of mankind will confirm the story in years to come. For there are reaches of the mind still undreamed of. And there are many mysteries of time and space and spirit to be shown to us. The stars look down. The night has a thousand eyes to search the soul of man and see if he's equal to his fathomless tomorrows. Where there are yet more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in our philosophy. In a moment, we'll return with our stars. Next week, the NBC Theater brings you another first in radio, a full-hour production of director Billy Wilder's great Paramount film comedy, 
A Foreign Affair. And starring in this hour-long drama will be Rosalind Russell, Marlena Dietrich, and John Lund. And now, here again are tonight's stars, Edward G. Robinson and William Demarest, and screen director, John Farrell. John, it's been great fun for Bill and me, slipping back into character for our parts, Night Has a Thousand Eyes. Well, I just hope Bill here doesn't start having one of his visions again. What, you mean uh, cool, solid Bill Demarest is in tune with the supernatural? He thought he was. Now, now, wait a minute. I know what you're talking about. And I really did have a vision. Yes? I was standing talking to Johnny on the set, and suddenly I knew one of the camera booms was swinging around behind us. What happened? He yelled, Johnny, fall on your face. Well, did you get hurt? My nose was almost broken. By the camera boom? No, by falling on my face. Oh. <laughs> there wasn't a camera within 50 yards. <laughs> well, I had a vision. Now, uh, we don't have to be visionaries, John, to know that your direction inspired Bill and myself and everyone else connected with the picture. You did a great job. Check, Eddie, that goes for me, too. Thanks very much. But suddenly I seem to be getting a vision myself. What do you see? I see us being cut off the air if we don't say good night. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good, good night, folks. <laughs> and good night to you, Edward G. Robinson, William Damarest, and John Farrell. <laughs> night Has a Thousand Eyes was adapted by Milton Geiger from an original story by Cornell Walry. Music was by Henry Russell. Production was supervised by Howard Wiley. Associate producer, Bill Carr. Your announcer has been Frank Barton. Night Has a Thousand Eyes was presented through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, currently releasing My One True Love, starring Phyllis Calvert, Melvin Douglas, and Wanda Hendricks. Edward G. Robinson is currently making the 20th Century Fox production, The House of Strangers. William Demarest may be seen in Paramount's Technicolor production, Whispering Smith. Listen again next week for the NBC Theater's full-hour presentation of... Screen Directors Guild Assignment, production of Foreign Affair, director Billy Wilder, stars Rosalind Russell, Marlena Dietrich, John Lund. The Screen Directors Guild program came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Okay, um, Screen Directors Playhouse, uh, Night Has a Thousand Eyes, starring Edward G. Robinson from February 27th, 1949. A few things about that. Of course, it's a, a story about... Uh, psychic phenomena and the ability to foresee the future and all that, which was quite advanced to do that on radio in 1949. And of course, the film is, is also quite advanced and pretty much forgotten these days. Um, but Edward G. Robinson does a great job in the lead role in this. And you also heard at the very beginning and probably later, uh, Paul Fries, uh, the great character actor voice, was the narrator at the beginning. The uh, show was written by um, Cornell Woolwich, who wrote uh, many episodes of Suspense, and also the Alfred Hitchcock thriller Rear Window, one of the really great Alfred Hitchcock films. Um, John Farrow, the director, is um, or was married to Maureen O'Sullivan, who was uh, Jane in the Tarzan movies and also with the Marx Brothers in A Day at the Races. And they had a bunch of kids, including Mia Farrow, who you know as the star of the, um, what I would call probably the last great horror film of the 60s, Rosemary's Baby. She also was uh, married to Woody Allen for a while and is even now still engaged in all kinds of crazy accusations with all of that. So anyway... Um, <laughs> the Farrow family has continued on for generations, and they're still making the news these days, too. All right, you can turn the lights back on now, and um, join us again next week for another venture into the creepy supernatural world. We're going to um, go back and uh, listen to an episode of Lights Out next week. Um, Lights Out and Quiet, Please, which we'll also be hearing in the next few weeks, were my two favorite of the creepy radio horror shows, with Quiet, Please, for me, having the edge. Um, Arch Ober was a little bit more graphic. Quiet, Please was a little bit more subtle. So I like subtle horror more than I like graphic horror, but Obler did a great job, too, so he's right up there. Anyway, we'll have Arch Obler next week. And that is it for the good old days of radio show. You can hear comedy uh, or drama, depending on what we're doing, on Tuesday and more creepy supernatural next Thursday. So until then, this is John Tefteller saying goodbye. Mm -hmm.